All right, meet Jixus, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to First Foods. My name is Desiree Kane. I'm a Miwok Two Spirit living in occupied Arapaho territory here in Colorado. So welcome. Hi, good day, everybody. Um, welcome to First Foods again. I am Brooke, a Taino mother living in New York in the Tindicock territory. I'm the host of First Foods classes and we have some, uh, just some housekeeping to items to review before we start. Just wanna go over brief some, briefly some items with you like we always do every week. Just keeping in mind that coming to this space, we, we recognize, uphold and respect native nations and their life ways above all else as the ruling governance of Turtle Island and Abiala. Everyone attending this space, whether they are native POC or non-Indians uh, should uphold the same. Um, it's really important for us as indigenous people to recognize each other's territories and, and, and our sovereignties. Native knowledge, lessons learned are not for non-natives to monetize on or repackage as their own native knowledge systems belong to the cultural communities they come from and to the guest speakers in our programming. So please be mindful of that, respectful, and, and do not try to monetize on any of the information you've learned. Keeping in mind, this is also an intertribal space. So remember that we are all from different nations and different regions. And we what we may consider desirable food may not be desirable or may be different or may be called differently in another nation. Just please don't be disrespectful or belittle. And um, always remember that you know, respecting tribal food, land, and medicine sovereignty is also a part of land sovereignty and land acknowledgement. Remember that the majority of foods that we share may be, um, like I said, different before, and we don't want a space where people are claiming to have exclusivity over a certain food or a certain medicine, and we don't want to bring the space where people are using their knowledge to be more Indianer than the next person, so please just remember that this is an intertribal space. Foraging and harvesting. Always seek permission from tribal communities to forage or harvest. Um, as we've said many times throughout this show, some of the medicines might be seasonal or they might be left to replenish or they might have spiritual reasons for not picking them at that time. And so you always want to seek out to the local communities and, and medicine people of those territories. Again, it also plays back into land acknowledgement and respect if the answer is no. Food sovereignty. First people have the rights to hunt, fish, forage, and harvest on our traditional territories. So our food ways, whether healthy or unhealthy, are just not up for debate. It is our right to just figure out what food systems work best for us, um, contemporary or traditional. And please, just a friendly reminder, first foods is for educational, uh, purposes as well as culinary and um, gardening, but before you use any herb or plant for either cooking or medicines or tinctures, please consult your physician, medical herbalist, or suitable professional. And if you're from traditional community, you really want to uh, seek out your medicine keepers and your matriarchs. Okay, thank you. So welcome to First Foods, a program led by and made for indigenous people and our allies who are ready for a new day for old ways. We'd like to thank our partner, Ibex Puppetry, for the ongoing support as we build this program that makes critical knowledge available from the culture bearers that hold the oldest knowledge on the continent, something so many of us need at this time. So just welcoming everybody back to the space. Um, it's just been really an honor to have, you know, all these guest teachers here uh, every week on Thursday. But today we have a uh, Phoenix from the Nde or Apache Nation. And she's going to be teaching us Northern Native gardening techniques and how do you apply that to your apartment or, or just an urban setting in general. Um, she's going to begin soon, so she's teaching about, so, so, so basically the application of, of kind of like traditional techniques and how do you kind of bring it down small scale in an apartment. 
Uh, she founded also a natural medicine community group in 2012, which is a private group for practitioners and students that shares and discusses naturopathic topics, hosts classes on naturopathic subjects, ranging from medical herbalism and gardening, plant identification and more. Hi, Phoenix. Hi, everyone. So, hi, I'm Phoenix. I'm White Mountain Apache, raised uh, Mescalero, and um, I'm giving the class today, um, Urban Gardening and Your Apartment. So, let's go. Um, <laughs> the point of this class is to familiarize you with various basic indigenous American agriculture methods that can be condensed and applied in your home or in your apartment. When you're done with this class, you should be able to plan, create, maintain, and harvest your home garden. So for the first part, indigenous American methods, there are a lot of um, different methods of different tribal nations across the, U the, the Americas north and south that are used in, in agriculture today. Um, it ranges from um, water conservation, companion planting, um, uh, self-watering systems such as oyas, which are clay pots that are filled with water and put underground so that the water can kind of leach out and water the roots from underground. Dry farming techniques are most most well known in the southwest from the from the Diné, the Navajo, and the the Zuni and Pueblos, and also from Inde, from the Apache nations. Um, mulching with pumice or perlite; these are also taken from the southwest and and from further south also, because Mexico and further south also employed those methods. Um, mound gardening, where like for example, when you plant potatoes, you have to hill up the ground and just continuously add more. That comes, that, that is, well, potatoes are indigenous foods from South America. So of course their, their farming methods are taken from the same people that took the food. Um, hydroponic and aquaponic systems, such as chinampas from down in the Mexica in, in Mexico, which are floating gardens. They Floating, floating farms with the roots growing down into the water and the fish are fertilizing in all the other natural creatures. Uh, fish ponds with purposely planted water plants, such as uh, purposely farmed uh, cattails. And then for companion planting, there's pest and disease control. Certain plants were planted together to keep away bugs um, or discourage other, uh, discourage birds. Um, some plants were used to support and encourage growth, such as the three, the three sisters method of corn, beans, and squash. It's three to six types of plants that are always grown together, depending on your region. Usually corn, beans, squash, melons, uh, tomatoes, chilies, and sunflowers. And sunflower is also a type of diversion plant, which they draw a lot of bugs. Bugs like to eat them, and so do birds. So by planting them away from the main crops, you can, you can get di direct the birds away from eating the corn and they will eat the sunflowers. Now in, the, in our slide, you can see in the top left, there's Ed Mendoza from uh, Gila River Indian community in Arizona. And he is employing um, natural irrigation in dry farming. Then on the right, you'll see a picture of a modern day chinampa that is being maintained. Um, and on the bottom two pictures, you'll see one, a traditional clay oya pot, and next to it is a homemade one using two terracotta um, plant pots that are kind of uh, pasted together. It looks like with some sort of cement. And next to it is a diagram of how it, how it waters the roots from underground. So indigenous methods also included our fertilizer methods. Um, different types of fertilizers include rock composting, which is what you would consider um, taking all your garden scraps or your, your, your cooking scraps and just burying them and letting them rot. Um, feces, different types of animal feces, um, rabbit, deer, if you bury it in the ground, it, 
we knew the different, different indigenous peoples across the Americas knew that they could bury these feces and the, the plants would grow stronger. Wood ash. Wood ash is um, a fertilizer that was used to increase fertility of the plants because it has a higher, um, a higher uh, phosphorus and potassium ratio. So what, would, what we would notice is after fires, the, the, the land would come back. And one of the reasons for that is that the wood ash would, after the area calmed down and it rained, um, it's, it added nutrition to the soil so all the plants would grow up quickly. Um, compost tea or liquid fertilizers and fish and bone meal. Fish and bone meal, you know, burying your fish heads or your, your fish bones and scales and then planting over them. Compost tea, that's when you soak compost in water and then use that water or soak your food scraps and then we would use that water. A lot of it has to do, um, if you can, if you notice, a lot of it has to do with uh, sustain, sustainability. They're reusing everything, everything that can be reused. Everything feeds itself in a cycle. And all of these indigenous methods, when the, when, when other people came, when the settlers came, um, they took these methods and they, they needed to learn how to, how to farm because they, they didn't have these ways. So they applied it inside of their agriculture techniques. And uh, I'm really skimming on that one right now, but, um, and it has modernized into what we see today, all these, all these different techniques used. So part two, types of gardening. Um, hold on. Sorry, my screen. <laughs> um, so th there, there's two types of gardening. There's soil-based gardening in your home and there's water-based gardening. And again, indigenous methods are used for our modern water-based gardening. Um, soil gardening, you can grow in grow bags. You can, you can buy grow bags online or you can make grow bags yourself out of um, old clothes, um, old sheets, old uh, flour sacks, rice bags. Containers can be bought or made by repurposing water bottles or other containers. Raised beds are, they're garden beds that are built on top of the ground, usually either for ergonomics because you're, you know, to, to help your back or because the soil is not good enough or safe enough to grow in. And then growing directly in the dirt, that's self-explanatory. So our water-based methods are hydroponic and modern hydroponics is you can use it with an air stone or without an air stone or use a drip system. And I'll get into that. And um, using timers, you can use automatic timers with this. Um, aquaponics is combining regular air stone or without air stone hydroponics or immersion hydroponics with fish and crustaceans because you use the nutrients from these living creatures to um, feed your plants. And then another newer one is aeroponics and I'm not going to um, hash that out here, but it's basically using a sprinkler system to spray the roots themselves. And in the picture that I'm going to show you, I'm showing you examples of different um, grow medium. So you have vertical farming. This one, this person in the top left is repurposing um, those hanging shoe, back, shoe racks like you get from Walmart. Um, the one underneath it, it's also another shoe rack just placed on its side. And then uh, the two in the middle, those are grow bags that you can buy, um, buy online. And the far right one, it's a laundry basket. Some people use um, laundry baskets with wider holes or they widen the holes. And it's very useful for growing um, onions or strawberries, especially if you're short on space. And now on this page, we're looking at some of the hydroponic examples. So the top left is aeroponics. It's that sprinkler system, like I said, with the water hitting the roots. Deep water culture, um, that's, it's like a, chin, it's a chinampa. They're floating the, the pots in the water and having an air stone to oxygenate. Um, you don't need an air stone to, to oxygenate. Now we'll get into that again later. Drip system, self-explanatory. The water drips in through the top and drips out through the bottom at 
different times of the day. Uh, nutrient film, that's just the very tips of the roots sitting in water and then draining out. And that's it, the bottom left, I mean, bottom right, that's what I was talking about. Um, hydroponics with no air stone, just as the roots grow, it depletes the water and nutrition. And this is an example of a homemade um, aquaponic setup where the nutrition from the fish water is pumped up and fed into the container, and then it drips back down into the, into the container with the fish. So when you're, when you're gardening, you have to plan where you want to garden, um, either outdoor or, or indoor. Now, when you plan on where you're gonna garden, that's gonna depend entirely on your home or your apartment. Some apartments are short on space or, or don't have a balcony at all. So you might have to do indoor gardening. Some have small balconies, so you can do a combination of indoor and outdoor. And some people are lucky enough to have a, a home or an apartment on the ground floor with some yard. So you could do some outdoor gardening. Now, when you plan outdoor gardening, you have to figure out sun exposure. How many hours of sun does that spot you want to plant in um, how much? How many hours of sun does it receive? Does it receive partial shade where a certain part of the day it has sun and the rest of the day it doesn't have any? Or the partial shade, does, does the sun shift? Like on this time of the day, the left side has all the sun and on this time of the day, the right side does. So you gotta plan on where the sun is to, to plan on where you're gonna put your plants. On outdoor gardening, it is very important to figure out your grow zone. It's also called your hardiness zone. It's the place that you live. The date of your last frost is used to calculate it. So um, in the desert, um, you're gonna be living in like zone 10 or sometimes in California, uh, zone nine. And that's, those are pretty hot zones, not, don't really have a long frost time. It usually has a long growing season. Um, when you go further up north, you're gonna have zones like uh, zone six or zone eight. And these zones have shorter, slightly shorter grow growing seasons. And you have to plan on what time of the year is it okay to plant certain plants. Like if they have a longer growing season or a shorter growing season, you have to plant it according to that region. And you can look it up online if you type in hardy, um, Grow, grow zone or hardiness zone, it'll tell you what times of the year for your zone you should plant what. Um, you have to plan for pests and diseases. If you're, if you're growing outdoor, you're gonna have a lot of um, pests and pests, in, which means animals and plants, I mean, animals and, and bugs. Indoor, you're gonna have some, but not, not as much. For indoor growing, you have to plan on lighting. There's it's in the house, so you're gonna have to make up for the lack of sunlight. Usually you can get like a 1000 watt LED light or 300 watt, you know, it depends on, on your space, how much you can grow. And there's many, many examples to choose from. Um, air circulation indoor to mitigate heat and to strengthen the plant through movement. Manual strengthening, you have to shake the plant to stimulate strength in the stems because it's not outside so it's not it's not getting its exercise from the wind so you have to give it that exercise indoor so it can have so it can be healthy and in this slide i'm showing examples of um, indoor setups so this top left setup it's somebody repurposed what looks like a hutch for china and they installed grow lights and they're growing sprouts in it. If I was gonna do that, I would cover up that glass and I would probably line the inside with, um, with mylar reflective material or, or at least aluminum foil if I couldn't get the mylar because um, it will increase the light and it's not gonna be an eyesore in the house. Um, on the right side, you'll see a regular metal rack like you can get from Costco and a simple light setup. And then of course the bottom, but the bottom right are little desk lights that you can use. If you're only growing a few herbs in the kitchen or a few herbs at your desk, you can, you can put those little lights. 
Now on this page, we have a full grow tent example. So the grow tent on the left, it looks like it's growing chili peppers or something like that. But um, basically it looks like deep water culture going on in it. The grow light is, you will decide the placement of your grow light. If the light is too hot and it is burning your plants, you have to pull it up. If it's um, too cold and your, your, your plants start leaning for the light, they get tall and thin and weak, you have to bring the light closer and you're probably gonna have to mound up dirt around the, the stem to keep it stable. On the right side, it shows air intake for a grow tent. Now grow tents heat up very quickly because they're, they're closed. So in the bottom, there's two holes for passive intake. As the, as the filter sucks up air and blows it out with the fan, it'll naturally suck in air from the outside into the bottom. Now, carbon filter, you can put the filter on the intake side if you're concerned about air purity for the plant. If you're concerned about pollen in your home, depending on what kind of plants you're growing in your, in your grow tent, it could have a lot of pollen, people can get allergies. So you might wanna put a filter like in, the, like in the illustration. And I've written and circled where a light would be in that space. Usually about eight inches about, above the top of a plant is good for, the, for a light. And again, you'll, you'll know, if the plant starts burning, pull it up. If it's leaning, put it down. Now, regardless of whether or not you grow in the house or outdoors, you have to consider pollination. Um, if you don't have a lot of pollinators, like say you live in the city, uh, like I do, I don't have any bees. I don't have any ladybugs. I don't have anything really aside from um, plants that will, you know, aphids basically. So I have to manually pollinate my plants. So for the squash plants and cucumbers, I have to take the male flower, touch it to the female flower, make sure it gets all that pollen in there. And that's that. Some plants like tomatoes and chilies, you can just tap the flower and it'll self pollinate. But again, some plants have male and female flowers and you have to, you have to pollinate them. Or some plants have both the male, the male and female parts on the same flower and you still need to take like a Q-tip, you know, the cotton swab for your ear or a makeup brush or something and get that pollen on the female part. Vertical gardening is a tool that you can use for both outside and indoors. And vertical gardening saves space. It's really good for apartments because small balconies, where, where are you gonna put anything? And it's good for homes because you can increase your yield, your harvest, um, by growing vertically, it maximizes your space. So um, vertical gardening is also support. For example, if you're growing um, cucumbers, they have to grow up. So it's better to trellis them so that they can grow straight up. Um, microgreens, you can sprout them indoors or outdoors, but keep in mind it uses up large amounts of seed. Microgreens is when you take the small seed, you sprout them either in water or soil, and once they get like two, three inches tall, you trim them, you eat them in whatever you want to eat. But like I said, by, by always harvesting the, the children like that, um, it uses up too much seed and uh, you have to plan for that. When you're growing, you should talk to your plants and pray for them. You should take care of them because they're taking care of you. And um, it's really, Science is already backing up what indigenous, what our people, our indigenous peoples already know, which is treating your plants nicely, talking to them and praying for them actually affects them and lets them grow healthier, stronger and give better yields. Another thing to keep in mind is to stagger your planting so that you can grow continuously. Now, if you're growing outside, your grow zone is going to impact what you can grow. So you might not be able to stagger planting outside but if you're growing in the house you can definitely um you know plant something new every every other month or every month so that by the time you harvest the one thing there will be a new harvest next month and so on and so forth and i put marker microgreens twice 
So in this picture, this is examples of, of container gardening with vert vertical container gardening. Um, that picture right there shows a trellis for either tomatoes or um, you can actually make a similar kind of trellis for squash or for cucumber, but you have to use a lot of twine to like kind of tie it up. On the right side, those are bean, baby bean plants and um, they're growing up in a triangle trellis made out of simple bamboo or reeds. Anything really that you can, you can use an old broomstick or something, anything that you have that they can climb on. I mean, for, for viney plants like beans or cucumbers, I hang up an old, um, it's, like, it's a fishnet. A fishnet, it's made out of, um, it's braided fishnet, handmade fishnet, it's an old one. And I just hang it up and the plant crawls on it. So in this picture, and then uh, on the left, um, an example of vertical gardening in a raised bed. If you look at the bottom, there's a raised bed with some mulch in it. And if you see there, they trains the tomatoes to grow up and they trains the squash to grow up as well. So as you can see, it, it maximizes space. If you can put several of those beds next to each other growing vertically, you could have a full like supply of food for yourself and your neighbors and your, your relatives. That's what's great about vertical gardening. On the right side, you can see some square foot or container gardening going on on a balcony. And it's very simple. They build a, a raised bed and um, for every square foot in, in square foot gardening, you can plant more than one plant per plot usually, except for big plants like, like, um, like cucumber or squash. And there's a very good website. If you go to Google and type in square foot gardening planner, it'll bring you to this website that you can actually plan and visually see, okay, how many plants can I put per plot? I use that tool. Okay, so urban compost and fertilizer. For simple rock compost, they can, you can do the lasagna method in, a, in any size of container that you have. If you have a big gorilla, gorilla box, a big plastic box, or something like um, an old toy box that you don't use anymore, you just lasagna layers, the brown matter. Brown matter is anything dry and brown like paper, shredded newspaper, it always has to be shredded. Um, straw, um, not grass clippings. Grass clippings are green matter. They're, they're leaves, they're living leaves that you cut and they will rot and make nitrogen. So if the grass is dry and brown like straw, then you can use that as brown matter. So it's three parts of brown matter to one part food scraps or, or um, grass clippings. Uh, and if you don't know what part measurement is, so if you use a bucket, that bucket represents one part. So if you use three buckets of straw, over that, shovel one bucket of scrap and then repeat it until the lasagna layers are built up. And then you put a little bit of water and close the lid, call it a day. Um, for your food scraps, you can dry and powder seafood shells and fish bones and scales. If you have a dehydrator, that's great. If you wanna use your oven, go ahead. Um, if you live in the desert or other hot climates, you can, you can just air dry it outside if you're comfortable with that. But you have to powder them and it increases the surface area once you powder them and lets, them, um, lets the microorganisms and the animals and the bugs in the compost like break it down quickly. You can, you can compost citrus, but I would be careful about that because um, it could raise the acidity, that it could raise the pH of your, your compost and some plants don't like that. Uh, banana peels are very useful for adding uh, potassium, as are avocado shells. Um, Eggshells for calcium, you should powder them. And bones, now if you're going to for, uh, compost the bones, you have to wash them good, boil them for an hour, drain it, <laughs> rinse it, stick it in the oven for about an hour on like, 300 to 350 degrees and then take when it's done take it out 
cool it, then break it and powder it. That's how you make bone meal. Um, bone meal adds um, phosphorus um, to and, and other minerals to compost, and those are needed for for fruiting. You, you should turn over your compost one time a, one time a week, and it might be a little bit messy to be mixing it mixing it up or just dumping it from one container into another because it, it might be a little wet. But if it's too wet you should stop adding scraps and just add a little more, more dry matter and leave it for another week. You can use compost activators. Compost activators are things that they sell in the garden shop and it contains bacteria, fungus, different microorganisms to wake up. They, they kind of hatch in the, in the compost and then start digesting everything. Um, if your compost smells bad, just it smells like a trash can. Uh, you sh that means it's gone anaerobic. There's no oxygen in it, so bacteria is growing. So you should dry it outside, flip it every other day until it's dry, amend it with dry matter, and then you can add some more um, some water and activator, and then use it to you know start to recompost again. Um, if your compost looks like dirt and it smells like earth, then it's done. You should spread it out in a wide container or on a tarp or plastic or a sheet to dry and you just keep on stirring it every day until it dries, then you can use it. And the reason why you do that is you want to cure your compost um, to, um, it, like, it like deactivates some of the, it, it changes the pH, it balances the pH, it kills off some of the fungus and bacteria that might be, but, but yeah that might be in it and um, it makes it, it's a chemical process, okay? It breaks it down, makes it, makes it able to absorb to your plant roots. <laughs> okay, in this picture, on the left, there is a diagram of how to make a quick compost bin from like a plastic, a, a regular plastic container or a wooden container at home. And it shows um, you can drill holes in the side to help with the airflow. On the right side, it's a regular bucket like you would get from Ace Hardware. Just poke some holes in the top, do the compost like I said. And in this one, it's good because you can shake it or you can roll the compost barrel. And that way you don't have to open it up and like stir it or transfer it to another container. Okay. Um, I think I already did that, did I? Yeah. Okay, so, okay, I repeated some things, oops. Okay, so for urban compost and fertilizer, you have vermicompost, which is worms. Now, garden worms are not the night crawlers. Night crawlers are really long worms. They, it's a species of earthworm that digs really deep. So unless you're having compost bin outside with an open bottom, you would not be using um, night crawlers in your house. They, they wouldn't be able to live. They wouldn't be happy at all. They, they would try to escape. It would just be a horrible mess. And then they will die because they're not in their environment. So you buy some regular garden worms. They sell them at every, every gardening shop. When you make your container, this is how I made mine and it's working fine. I took a five gallon water bottle. I added some dry matter, shredded newspaper and whatnot to the bottom and then um, some soil. And then I added the worms. I added a little bit more soil on top of them. Then I put paper and some food scraps, covered it with a little bit more soil, and I let them go. And as the worms go up and eat the matter, then they'll start you know, making dirt. They'll, they'll poop out the dirt. And then you just keep on adding more food scraps, dry matter. You always put food scraps on top of dry matter. Um, you can also buy worm farms or make a different one um, from um, plastic Walmart drawers. You know, those plastic pull-out drawers that you get from Walmart. Um, that one, for those, if you're going to use Walmart containers, um, chest of drawers to make a worm farm, you're basically going to have to poke large enough holes into the bottom of, or, or cut out the bottom of the drawer and then like 
screw in mesh wire, wire mesh, or, or some sort of screen so that the worms can crawl up through them, but the dirt will not be falling out. Um, the liquid will collect in a pot in the bottom tray, and you can use that liquid as, as compost tea. So this is an example of using um, containers at home. In the bottom containers, they put, they screwed, um, sorry, screwed, they drilled holes in the bottom for the liquid to come out. And as you can see in the diagram on the left, that's how it works. The liquid goes down through the mesh, drips into the bottom tray, the worms keep on going up. And when all of your trays are full of dirt, um, then it's time to uh, put your worms in a new container and uh, take out the, the dirt and start the cycle again. This is um, how to use a trash can. And it's the same concept. You see drainage holes on the bottom and um, the layers of screen on the inside. Liquid fertilizer. This is, um, it can be the worm compost drippings. It can be soaking your food scraps like bananas or, or lettuce lettuce veins or, or cabbage in water and then using that water you can do that with or without an air stone if you use an air stone you can you can soak them for several days if you're not using an air stone you can only soak them for a day or two if you live in a hot climate like mine you can only do it for a day and then you have to move on you can steep completed compost in water with large air stones and some people feel like it gets the nutrition faster to the roots when you water the plants. Um, I, I really didn't see a difference, but some people, you know, swear by that. Um, you can mix ash or potassium chloride to, as an amendment to your current soil. Um, you'll see if you have potassium deficiency or or if your plants are starting to fruit, you may want to, you might want to mix that with water and then water it directly in the plants. Steel wool in water or rusty nails in water. Plants need nutrition. They're just like us. They need, they need vitamins, they need minerals. And one of the things they need is iron. If they're not getting iron, then um, they, they're not able to breathe. They're, they can't make, it's like blood, you know, they can't make it, they can't, they can't pass nutrition properly into their leaves. So um, you'll see iron chlorosis. The veins will be dark, the rest of the leaf will be light. You can solve that by soaking steel wool in water. And then when, it, when that rusty water is there, dilute it or just add it straight to the pot. Um, NPK, like I said, um, vitamins, minerals, plants need nitrogen, uh, phosphorus and potassium, N, P and K. Those are the main nutrition that, that they use. Now, every plant has a different nutrition ratio that's op, the most optimal for it. So when you're, when you're planting your garden and you're wondering about nutrition, you have to check what plants you have, which ones are better um, companion. Like for example, uh, beans. Beans are great with corn because beans draw up nitrogen. And corn needs nitrogen to, to grow all of those leaves. So beans draws that up. Now melons and, and squashes and cucumbers, they draw up um, potassium and phosphorus. So when, when the corn is fruiting, it needs those nutritions. So they kind of complement each other. But if you're growing in containers and they're all separate, then you have to take into account, okay, this, this plant needs, this needs to grow like this. I need to make sure the, the corn has more nitrogen than potassium or, or phosphorus and so on and so forth. And you can Google that, type in, you know, uh, nutrient ratio for basil, nutrient ratio for radishes. Um, liquid hydroponic nutrition. Now there are hydroponic nutrition that is sold in bottles. They have part A and part B, and then you mix them together. That is called mineral. Mineral is just, as I said, straight nitrogen, potassium, um, phosphorus, calcium, all of these things mixed together. Organic 
hydroponic nutrition is like, it's like, it's liquid um, compost basically. Uh, let me see where am I? To make aerated compost, um, to make your aerated compost, you would put one third pounds of compost with one third molasses and one fifth of water soluble kelp, which is a type of seaweed. You can use, um, you know those supplements they sell at the, at the vitamin shop, the kelp supplements? You can either open it and use the powder or you can grind the pill or you can actually buy, they sell, I think it's called wakame at the store, the dried Japanese kelp, as long as it's not salted. Or you can buy, if you, if you know some, a shop that sells it from the, the Northwestern territories, you can, you can buy their kelp. Um, anyways, you, you mix that together for every gallon of water. And then you put that inside of like a cheesecloth or a tea bag. And then you drop it into like a trash can that has um, a big old air stone in it. And you just let it sit with, with the air stone running for like three days. After three days, you turn it off, you, you take everything out, and now it's ready for use. The, the molasses feeds the, the microorganisms that are already in that compost that you made. And the, the kelp adds trace minerals. So you see that picture? That's what I was talking about. So you can take a, you can take a bucket, like a very clean paint bucket or an Ace Hardware bucket, and just like that, fish stones, regular fish stones from the pet store, you can get, I wouldn't use small ones, I would use a really big one. And that's it. You can either hang the bag out and close the lid so that the lid will keep the bag in place or just let it float by itself. Or like on the other side, uh, some you can put sticks in like reeds or whatever and let it soak. All right, diseases and nutrition. The most common issues for plants that are indoor or outdoor, um, heat, light, and water. I cannot tell you how many times people hit me up and they're like sending me pictures. Hey, what's wrong with my plant? And then I'd be like, well, is it too hot? Or how much light does it get? Are you watering it uh, properly? Is it too wet? So if it's too hot, um, your plant will start curling up on itself like trying to shade itself, um, either curling up or curling down, depending on the plant. My tomato plants, okay, they curled up. Um, I had some spinach plants, plants, they curled up. I have bean plants that curled down. So it just depends on, on what's going on with the plant. Some plants, um, the up curl or the down curl can be caused by diseases, but when you rule out heat, light, and water, then you can look at diseases. So if it's too much light, you can, if your temperature on the indoor of your in, indoor garden is good, but there's too much light, it will act like it's burning because it's too much light. They need to sleep. They, they can't stay up too long. They get burned out. Um, water, if you stick your plant, your finger into the plant and when you take it out, it's too wet. Oh, that's too much water. If you start seeing little, so a white thing like molds growing across the top, that's too much water. Now you're growing fungus. If you see mushrooms, then there's too much water and not enough oxygen. Keep in mind that when you're, it, tribal and error, sorry about that. <laughs> Keep in mind that most of the time it's trial and error. So when you're planting, you're gonna have to figure out how to read your plants and it's like, the way your plants talk to you before is not how they're gonna to talk to you in, in a new area. So like when I was growing up and I was growing at my grandmother's house, um, I had it all down. When I started, when I started living in the city, um, everything that I thought I knew about planting in a yard is not how, I, how it goes when you're growing outside. So you'll, you'll have to figure out what's good for your plants. If something really bad happens, like the bugs really get to it, or you get a, you really get like a mosaic virus or something really bad, you're gonna have to dig out that plant 
um, replace the soil. You're gonna have to sanitize the pot, replace the soil. If you're growing it directly in your yard, just replace the soil from around it and just um, start all over. Sometimes, it, sometimes it's like that. Identifying plant nutrition seeds, uh, nutrition uh, deficiencies. This is great. When you go on Google, you can type in um, plant nutrient deficiency charts and it'll show you different pictures, how to read it. Um, and this is great. I wish I didn't accidentally kill one of my plants the other day, but um, there was a magnesium deficiency going in on my indoor uh, garden. And I didn't notice it because the light from the grow light was so red and magnesium deficiency, it's not pictured here, but it can cause purple reddish, um, looks like burn, but it's not a burn, but it's purple red on the leaves. And I, I didn't see it because the indoor light is red. So you, when you're growing indoors, remember to um, turn off the light and actually look at them so you don't do what I did. <laughs> This is tomato leaves and nutri nutrient deficiencies in tomato leaves. So the top left, you can see not enough nitrogen will make the plant just in general yellow and failure to thrive. It won't be able to make new growth, no new leaves. Uh, phosphorus makes the leaf curl down. That one you also have to check, see how, you, how phosphorus, potassium and magnesium, all of them at the top and calcium, they all look burned. So if you, if you are not living in a very hot area, if you otherwise rule out heat or light, it, it, then it could be one of these deficiencies. So the only thing you can do is just supplement with a with bone meal or um, Epsom salt for magnesium, but only put a little bit like a spoon of Epsom salt to like a five gallon bucket of water and then try it. Calcium, powder the eggshells, soak them in water, pour it directly in the plant. Okay, so when you're when you're looking forward to your harvest, uh, you have to remember that the different plants that you are tending to, the fruit will ripen in intervals. So not all of the chilies that you planted will just you know, grow chilies and, and ripen them all at the same time. You might have one chili plant with one chili that's ready and the rest of them are not. You might have, um, you know, two plants that will give you like three chilies and that's all you got. So when you pick them, basically your food will become seasonal at your house. Whatever is available, that's what you pick. That's what you can use for that day. That's what, that's what that plant can give you. And when you're harvesting remember it's slightly painful for your plants you know so when you talk to them and you you tell them um what you what you need to be doing and you you're letting them know that um that you appreciate them when you t when you pick the fruit from them it will taste better they will be happier and when you tell them that you're i apologize to them because i i know that it's painful when you when you pick the leaves or whatnot. And you just try to, I take soil, a little bit of the clean soil, and I put it on the raw ends of where I picked. I mean, my soil is sterile aside from the nutrients that I put in. But if you're using your regular garden dirt outside, I wouldn't put soil on their, on their cuts because you don't know if there's, you know, some sort of organism, a pathogen that can infect them. So you could use um, diatomaceous earth, diatomaceous earth, and that's, um, it's, a t it's like dinosaur powder, I call it, okay? It's little, little diatoms that they powdered and it, it kills bugs, but it also, you, when you put it on their cuts, it keeps out um, bugs as well. And um, when you harvest or throughout the harvest, the season, do light feedings of a high phosphorus and potassium fertilizer and calcium because these things are, are really necessary for fruit formation. So you don't get something called blossom end rot. And that's when the bottom part of your tomato or the bottom part of your, your cucumbers, squashes, eggplants, they start rotting and then they die. And I could show you something like that in a minute, in a minute. 
So, so this is a picture of what it looks like when you harvest some seasonal things um, for, from your garden. So this harvest right here, instead of having like so many tomatoes at one time, the house could only have the house only had a couple a, a couple tomatoes, one eggplant. So this right here can be used for today's dinner, tomorrow's dinner, and lunch. So basically when you're growing in your house, unless you're growing large amounts and really taking advantage of like vertical gardening and you know hydroponic gardening, growing indoors and outdoors, unless you're really doing everything to, in to have a large yield, you're probably only gonna get enough for your household. And that is actually fine. If you only have enough for your household, then that is, that is something to be appreciative for. It's very, it's very good. And that's it, that's all I got for right now. Oh, this is pictures of my garden. <laughs> and okay, where I'm at, it was 102 degrees by seven or 8 p.m. So, and in these pictures, it was the daytime. On the left, I have my Pima tomatillos with some Italian basil growing on. And I really am happy for my tomatillos because it hit 120 degrees and they survived, they're champions. On the right side, that's an example of a tomato plant that got burned. So this tomato plant, it lived through from March and now it's June. It's still going, but it's, it's, it's really suffering. And I just didn't have the heart to like pull it out. So I've been shading it and trying to keep it comfortable because I, I, I feel bad about ripping it out. And this is the other part of my garden. So from a distance, you can see I have some um, okra and some desert mint. And then on the far left, I have uh, three cucumber plants growing. On the far right corner, I have a watermelon plant, uh, an Apache watermelon plant growing. And I kind of just, they were growing vertically, but because it is so hot and the wind is so hot, it's better for me to let the vines run on the dirt so that the water can evaporate from the soil and keep them cool. And then in the middle, I have greens. I have um, Swiss chard and kale and bok choy that I'm using as lettuce. I cannot grow lettuce in this temperature, it's too hot. Lettuce needs like 70 degrees Fahrenheit to sprout and that it's too warm out here. Even that's the temperature of my refrigerator. They can sprout in the fridge, but they can't even grow in the grow room. Um, so I'm growing bok choy and chard, and that's a good lettuce replacement. And there is a, there is a small tomato plant in there, but you can't see it. And that's, um, uh, up close of my, on the right side, Syrian mint. On the left side of the bok choy, that is really a summer champion. And that's my cucumbers on the left. One of them, um, well, one of them is growing a lot of cucumbers, but you can't see it because they're running away from the sun. You get, you can see a little bit of a flower over there. And on the right side, another close up of my my sad tomato plant. And that's it. All right. Thank you so much, Phoenix, for that. I really enjoyed it. I think it was amazing. Um, Desiree, if you want to open up to Q and A to the rest of the group this time. Sure. Let me make it now all people can unmute themselves. Does anyone have any questions? We have, uh, looks like 13 people in the class today. 13, I've been seeing that number a lot this week. Yeah. Almost every day, multiple times a day. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. So I'm sorry if I move too quickly. Um, if you if you had any questions about what I said, now's your chance. I'm all for it. I do. What's up? Um, hi there. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I've I've I learned so much every single week from these these events, and you know I am greatly appreciative to every to everyone. That being said, uh, Phoenix, my sister is growing tomatoes. Um, she's kind of new at at this. She just barely began gardening. I'd say no more than maybe about a, a year ago. 
when would be the best time for her to take her tomato plants outdoors? She's very, very concerned that they're not going to 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 even bother growing at a normal at a normal rate. In, in so is she growing them? Is she growing them indoors? She's yes. growing them indoors. Yes. Okay. What's good about growing indoors is that you can take the plants from your indoor garden and then uh, acclimatize them for the outdoors. Mm -hmm. So I would do that from like. It depends on her zone. Like if she, where what where what state? What Washington. What area? Washington. Oh, that's a colder zone. So she should take them out maybe in the afternoonish in the when the sun is not so strong, but it's still out. That's when she should take them out and leave them there until the evening and then take them back in. So then what happens is that because is it really cold at night over there? Uh unfortunately, yes. Okay, so she should take them outside and leave them to in the early cool it cool part of the evening and then take them back in. And you do that for maybe a week or so and just keep on increasing the time that it stays outside. And that's how you acclimatize them to the outdoors without them shocking and dying. And also do, she has, um, do, do her tomato plants grow to a certain height and then stop or do they just keep on growing? Um, from the last I checked, they had just kept on growing and they had not shown any signs of stopping what's, whatsoever. Okay, there's two types of tomatoes. You have determin uh, determinate, which are tomatoes that grow to a certain size and then stop like a bush. Mm -hmm. Those are great for apartments, but she's got indeterminate. So they're like Medusa. They just keep on growing and growing <laughs> and growing. Now those ones, you have to prune them and you can actually root the suckers. When you prune your tomato plants, mm -hmm. um, you can stick them inside of water or, or damp soil and then they'll start sending out roots and then she can give those clones away. But that's how, um, that's how she acclimatizes them to the outdoors, especially she has indeterminate. Those ones need, those ones, they, they want to go outside and spread their wings. They want to fly away. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right then. Well, that, that was all that I was hoping to ask. Thank you very, very much. And have also, yourselves the next, her to keep next in mind. Sorry. Um, Sorry. Keep in mind the nutrition for um, tomatoes. When they're fruiting, they, she needs to make sure she gives them enough like, um, like eggshells and like powdered banana peels and stuff like that. Um, eggshells, to, oh my gosh. Yes, for the <laughs> calcium. Because because tomatoes fall victim to uh, blossom end rot, which is usually caused from a calcium and magnesium deficiency. So if she starts seeing like it's not growing fruit, then she should make sure that when she goes to the garden shop, if she buys fertilizer, it has a zero nitrogen. Miracle Grow, by the way, if she uses Miracle Grow, it's not good for that because it has a lot of nitrogen. And if she'll just have a bunch of leaves and only either a couple tomatoes or none. Thank you. I'll be sure to to tell her that. And as as usual, keep up the ex the excellent work, every, everyone. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. Does anybody else have any questions? Now is the time if you've got some plant problems, it seems like Phoenix knows what she's talking about and can definitely give advice. Okay, somebody typed a question. Yeah, she I said, think oh, let's see. Gabby, I'm struggling with my indoor herbs and I'm wondering if that's because I haven't harvested them. I haven't been ready to cook with them yet and I thought I could keep them like a regular house plant, but they seem to be struggling. Okay, depending on the herbs, herbs are, are um, grown for their leaves. So um, you can harvest them whenever they have a large amount of leaves, you can harvest them. If they're struggling, they might need to be pruned because when you, pr when you trim some of, the, some of the tips of the herb plant, it'll send out, it'll encourage the sides of it to grow out and it become a nice little bush instead of like being long and thin. So like if you're growing basil, and it just keeps on growing straight you want to cut the top of the basil off when it's like maybe four inches tall like this tall cut the top off and it'll send out shoots on the side if you already have a long thin basil cut the top off at least three inches and it'll start sending out shoots um you might want to you might want to have to feed it or give it some more sunlight it depends on where you put it too i'd have without seeing where you have it or, or knowing that i i I can just say maybe change the soil, give it some more light and prune it. You, when you, if you're not ready to use your herbs, dry them, 
dry them or freeze them. Uh, I think we have a question also from Shannon. So I'm gonna unmute Shannon. Uh, Shannon, do you have a question for Phoenix? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Could you elaborate on when you're harvesting your plants, the importance of talking to them again and just go into a little bit more detail um, about that? Because that's really important. I was talking about that in my in my last um, workshop and I just think that's so important. I think a lot of people don't make those connections on how we tie, you know, um, other living organisms into, you know, um, with basically consuming their energy and consuming, you know, all that, that is, um, it's important, but at the same time, respecting what we're eating too, you know, and, and if you could just talk a little bit more about that, I would really appreciate that. Okay. So, um, we indigenous people, we, we know that historically we will talk to our plants, our there are relatives, there are their spirits, they're alive, they're, they're relatives to us. And like you see our family members when we grow, my grandmother, she will be grow, planting with me and she will be singing to the, the plants, you know? And it's just something we, we grow up with. Yes, this is our, the earth is like our, our grandmother and, and we, we take care of her, she takes care of us, we take care of all the other children that, that are on it. And what science has done lately just kind of ratifies what we already ancestrally know, which is when you talk to the plants very nicely, and when you take care of them, when you apologize to them for hurting them, um, they grow stronger, they grow healthier, more vibrant, mm -hmm. and uh, they bless you with better produce. And uh, I can't cite the names of certain studies off the top of my head, because I, I'm one of those people I have to write things down. But um, there are many numerous studies done throughout the world that just kind of ratifies what we all what are, we ancestrally know is that they have basic they have spirits they are living souls and they respond to us when we give them some of our energy when we when we give them some of our our job is to nurture them and to take care of them and protect them so when we do that their soul is happy so then they they grow happy and healthy and then they bless us i hope that answered what you were asking Yes, thank you so much. And do you know any other names of worms besides the red wigglers? I know there's one that starts with an L, but I keep forgetting what it's called. Do you know the other one? No, not off the top of my head. I, I know there a... was another type of red wiggler, but it's it's like Lumbricus <laughs> or I can't remember Lumbrella, but yeah. Um, but thank you. Thank, I, I um, really enjoyed your workshop. And I just you. know not the night crawlers. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, not, and I've, I've tried that. I've tried putting night crawlers in my worm bin years ago when I first started. And yeah, they do not live. <laughs> Tell they me what happened. Not. Did they escape? <laughs> they tried to escape. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Yucky. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? I'm open. I, I, I'll answer everything, really. I guess I have a question. Um, I don't know, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm Lori Heald and I'm sorry I had the time change uh, wrong. So I just arrived. I wondered if this, is, um, if this is being recorded, if I'd be able to watch it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, in the First Foods group where the class um, link was posted on Mondays at 11.30 MST, we premiere the class. So okay. this is the classroom portion. And then you'll be able to watch again with, um, you know, like our names on the bottom and things like that um, on Monday at lunchtime. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Brooke, is there anything you wanted to say? That was, was like so much to learn from you, Phoenix. Is really cool too because I, you know, I am trying to grow onions and like my leftover kitchen chopping carrots and all kinds of, you know, it's a like a funky menagerie by the one window I've got going. So I tell you what, if, I tell you what, if I was you and I was growing carrots from the scraps in the kitchen, um, I would only grow the carrots for the greens, to be honest, because when you when you try to reuse the carrots to grow, they're not going to give you another full carrot bag. It takes like 
six months for me to grow carrot out here. That's <laughs> six months and you get four inches, you know? Um, yeah. If you want to grow salad. That's not enough salad for me, okay? I need something bigger. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I would grow like the, the piece of carrot and you stick it in water. I would grow it for the greens. You can use the greens more like a, like a, like a more bitter type of parsley kind of thing. So I, I mean, I use it in soups and stuff, but I, I just I also wouldn't. like to eat them. You know, you can like just break them off and kind of chew on them. You wind up with very fresh breath. Your your like mouth feels. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm. So good for your liver as well. The bitterness of the of the greens, bitter greens. Mm -hmm. I have a problem growing onions out here because I am in zone ten, which is um, the same zone that has um, Arizona. Uh, New Mexico, the Sonoran and Chihuahuan deserts, basically same same zone. And um, I found out the hard way that uh, growing onion from seed is the best way to grow onion because mm -hmm. you know you'll get the full bulb and all that. If you grow them from the bulb itself from your kitchen, you're only going to get green onions. And I mean that's still good, but it's if you're growing it for the bulb, you're not going to get it. So anyway, growing the onions from the seed, they will not sprout in 80 degrees like. My grow room is at, at like 76 to 80 degrees, okay? They will not sprout. I gotta stick it, I have a little, like a drink fridge that's at 70 degrees and I put sodas in it. Like I have to put the, the seeds in a container, spray them, stick it in that fridge, take it out, put it under the grow light during the day, return it to the fridge at night and then the, the green onions will sprout. I, I, I can't grow them in zone 10 unless it's in the winter. Lettuce too. Hi, oh. Renee. She's very happy there. <laughs> Renee. Oh, I'm trying to. I got you. I muted it. Where's she going? Yeah, it's muted. Oh. No, you're good. Okay. We can hear you, Renee. Okay. Hi. Hi. Well, hello. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. Just listening to everything, and I think it's really everything you're talking about is like, you know, everything that I've been learning. But at the same time, I haven't been putting into practice yet. I feel like I'm still learning how to do all of uh, my own gardening, but. Mainly what I'm trying to do is allow my children to, to take it, to take over. And so I'm there with, as a support system and, you know, getting what they need and, you know, uh, allowing them to, to take charge. And I feel like uh, this year we're uh, with my daughter starting her garden and it's just like uh, down the block here. It's like half a block from us so we can walk over there and check on it. And uh, we're doing the three sisters. So we're hoping that this year we'll, you know, we'll have uh, the startings, even if we don't have a, a full garden, you know, effect right now, we'll have starters for, you know, to have more seeds for next year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're thinking along that line as we're going along, we've never had uh, uh, the kind of, uh, storage or space, you know, to do this before. Like now we've got, you know, we've got a porch, you know, we've got big uh, dining room areas where we can, uh, I think we can put in like a, um, uh, the shelving or, you know, to start that process. So we're, you know, we're coming along, you know, and it's been a long time since I've done this kind of gardening since my parents, you know, my parents had a big community garden, you know, um, mm. on our reservation. And, you know, we all pitched in, they had us doing everything. And uh, it just seems so easy because my parents knew how to do everything, right? And they had everything that we needed. So, but this time we're, we're, uh, we're doing this and it's like, wow, uh, oh yeah, we need this. Oh yeah, we gotta have, this kind of material. And uh, so it's like for us, it's like a relearning for me, relearning and then for my kids, letting them take charge and 
learning what to do and mm -hmm. I feel like having this kind of discussion is really helpful and it's encouraging because I I I prefer to hear from native people about our methods you know uh, mm -hmm. that, yeah that's me you know <laughs> yeah it feels better and feels right what I think is good to remember is that all of these modern agriculture methods that's out there, they're all originally incepted from indigenous people. Yeah. It's just been re repackaged, you know, by, it's been repackaged for a modern narrative. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the simplest way I'll put it right now. Like totally watering that down, but yes. Yeah. And so when people people don't realize that when they're when they're doing hydroponics, we're looking at it. And in Hawaii, some people would be like, "Yeah, we used to grow things in ipus in the in the gourds." Or some people would be like, "Yeah, you know, my people used to plant in chinampas and stuff. We still have those." Okay, why are you saying it's a new thing? Mm -hmm. You know, these are not new things. The only thing is condensing them and using modern containers, reusing. Walmart containers or Ace Hardware containers. That's the only thing that's new about it, the materials. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's really is, you can, you're still getting in touch with that ancestral knowledge, either from, from our individual nations or even, you know, knowledge that's passed from other, other nations, you know, yeah. and that's what all of this is. It's like a, like a coming together of all of everybody's knowledge. At least, at least we're putting the identification where the where it's due. You know, like we say, yes, this came from these people. Yes, we bury fish heads and we compost them and then grow on top of them. Yes, we do. We we do these things. You know, it's not like yeah. we just saying, oh yeah, this scientist came up with it. You yeah, know? have more of a, a history, a more like your like your parents did and like your grandparents did. Yeah. Like you were saying, yeah, that, my grandparents did that this relationship. Well. And uh, the other day on Tuesday, we were out um, at our Indian center here and we did a community garden. So a number of us came together, uh, native and non-native, but we, you know, we made it all native, you know, and uh, one of my uh, sisters came down and she had some really good, she had some awesome seeds, you know, so we used those and planted, you know, the three sisters as well. And did a spiral garden, you know, with um, uh, greens and then we had flowers and I mean, it was, it was just a great day. And that's, that's what I always envisioned, like, that's how it should be. And I, and I was talking to one of the young women and I said, just think, this is what our grandmothers did. We all came together and everybody put their hands to the work and so it wasn't just like, you know, everybody, you know, there was only like one or two people doing this. It was like there were many people, you know, bringing in, you know, putting the mounds in and planting the seeds and somebody else was doing something else over here and someone else doing something else. And, and we all had played our parts, right? So that's what made me feel good about it because I felt like, wow, you know, there was a lot to get done. But with all of us there, it was done, you know, within... Uh, probably about six hours, you know, we had everything put in. Yeah, brings the community together. So yeah. Laurie, Holt, Laurie Heald says, I live in Tucson, Arizona. Do you have any luck growing greens inside during the summer? Also, can I grow kale in complete shade on the front porch? It's over 100 degrees here. Awesome, that's totally my alley. So Tucson, Arizona, you are in 100 plus degrees just like me. Um, if you're gonna be growing outside on your porch, um, either grow it in the shade on that porch or put up a shade cloth if there's not enough shade during the day because the desert sun, when it hits them leaves, it will burn it up. I would recommend um, starting the plant. It's, it's actually late in the season to start it outside, but I mean, you got a 50-50 right here. I mean, half of them will die from the heat and half of them will live, even if you start them inside and acclimatize them. Sometimes you, you, you'll lose them you'll lose a couple within the first hour. So, I mean, you can, you can grow it outside on that porch in the shade. Um, you might have to spray them with water in the afternoon to mitigate heat stress. Um, you might not, oh wait, 100 degrees. 
Oh, it's over 100 degrees. I was gonna say, if it's 100 degrees, you're okay. If it's over 100 degrees, you might have to, you might have to spray it a couple times. Um, if you grow your greens inside the house, um, that's more ideal in the summer for zone 10. Um, put it in front of the window, bright light in front of the window. Don't let it touch the window. It will burn, <laughs> but you can put it in front of the window. And you have to worry about fungus gnats. When things are growing inside of the house, you have these little black gnats that just, sometimes it comes with garden soil. The microscopic eggs are in the soil. Once you start watering your plant, next thing you know, you see these little tiny, tiny black flies that just kind of land everywhere. Those are fungus gnats. Now what they do is they feed on the roots of your plants and they feed on the fungus in the soil and it will kill your plant. And they're, the maggots from them that live in the soil will kill your plant. And those are like the bane of the indoor plant existence. So you should put um, the, the diatom earth, DE, you can buy that at the, at the garden shop, sprinkle it at the topsoil. And then when you water your plant, just kind of don't wet the whole soil, just water a part of it and water it deeply. Because if you water the whole soil, then maybe the fungus gnats will come out. Um, neem oil is a good um, thing to mitigate that as well. I hope I answered your question about growing in, uh, in zone 10 in, in like over 100 degrees weather. Do it in the window or do it in the shade, but if it's in the shade, spray it with water. Yeah. I wondered about if it needs like any direct light to actually grow. Not if it's on the, I mean, if it's on the porch in the desert, no, it doesn't need direct light to grow. It'll get, the leaves will be different than if it was in the sun, like they will be wider and thinner, not as chunky or as, as crunchy mm -hmm. as the ones that are grown in direct sun. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if you're starting right now in June, you're in the, late in the season, that's all you can, you can deal with it. Mm -hmm. Right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hey Phoenix, so I kind of just wanted to ask you a question with regards to um, gardening mm -hmm. as part of food sovereignty, because a lot of times when we think about food sovereignty, we think about larger scale things, uh, people mm -hmm. back on the res, but I kind of want to see your perspective and maybe speak to indigenous people in, in urban settings in the city that this is something that they can do and how that relates to their food sovereignty and contributing to the whole of um, native sovereignty across uh, the US. Okay, so when you're growing, if you are growing in an urban setting, say in an apartment in a city or something, um, maybe you're short on space, you can only grow certain things. Maybe you have a little community going on over there, you have other natives or, or friends or relatives that are around you. And um, you each can grow, can work, help each other, um, grow your gardens and then trade with each other. Say, I, I got chilies this day. Okay, I want some tomatoes. You got tomatoes, you know? And then um, you have that relationship going. And you're not relying on the grocery stores. Right now, COVID-19 is going on. Um, people get sick from going to the grocery stores. Then you have people that are coughing on groceries in the grocery stores. If you're growing your vegetables, growing your produce at home, then you are liberated from using from being forced to use those capitalist systems of you know, the colonial government. You're, you don't have to go to the, the grocery store, expose yourself to people who are coughing, maliciously coughing on you or, and whatnot. And again, you can trade with your, your friends, trade with your community, help each other out with your garden. Hey, I got these bugs going on. You know, can you help me with it? And what do you have? You have neem oil? Okay, can I get some? You know, and so on and so forth. Does that answer the perspective about indigenous sovereignty? How can, how um, you can, you know, growing your own things, liberating you from going to those, those grocery stores and building your community. You can also, by the way, you can also grow if like, like if you're, if you're in um, that part of California that uses white sage, okay? If you manage to get white sage seeds and you wanna grow some, 
you can grow things for that local um, community that the tribes that there that are using those those sacred medicines and you can actually grow it for them and in the city you know it's not something they're not always able to go and forage they're not always able to go and find you know and if you can find it i mean how many people are trying to harvest it so it's better to just if you if you're there you want to support that the the tribe whose land you're on you can grow things for them and give it to them that's your way of of supporting their sovereignty as well Thank you. I think that was a beautiful answer. Uh, we have some questions on the chat, so I'm just going to kind of uh, read them through. Uh, Monica, she asks is recommendations for veggies that give a lot and can grow in pots. Okay. Um, if, she's, if she's growing indoors or outdoors, I would say tomatoes. Tomatoes always, cherry tomatoes, they grow a lot you know, in a pot, they need, tomatoes need at least a five gallon pot to be growing in, by the way, tomatoes, squash, one plants for a five, for a five gallon pot or 10 gallon pot. If it's a, if it's a larger um, determinate tomato, like a bush tomato, 10 gallon pot. If it's a small, tiny tomato, a five gallon pot. And um, see, chili peppers, if you prune your chili peppers when they're about four inches tall, you cut the center, It'll send outside shoots, it'll increase your yield. Um, greens. Greens are the number one thing that grows large quantities in pots and they grow quickly. Um, I mean, if she lives in the desert, it might be a little bit hard right now in the season, even if she's growing them indoors, unless she has a good grow light. Um, and even then some, some greens just don't like grow lights. I mean, I just grew a, a a kale, a dwarf Siberian kale that decided, you know, I hate this grow light, eh. and then I had to put it in the sun in front of the window. So I, you'll find out a lot of it is trial and error. Like sometimes the plants respond to you one day, then you plant some more seeds and they don't want to respond to you the way they're supposed to. Um, what else grows? Cucumbers, space saver cucumbers. That's the name of the, of the, um, the variety. Um, or, or Bushmaster, or I think it is Bushmaster cucumbers. They grow like more than 20 cucumbers on a two and a half foot vine or at least that's what i grew out here maybe you'd only grew that long because it's too hot but it gave me a lot of cucumbers <laughs> um what else basically if she wants to grow a lot in a very small space vertical gardening train your zucchinis to grow upward which means trellising stick some sticks get some jute twine and just keep on tying the tying it and growing it up. Cut cut the old leaves off and keep growing it up. If you don't want the zucchini to die quickly to end its life cycle, you pick the zucchinis when when they're still smallish. Don't let them grow to the full size of like your arm, you know, because once they do that, they feel it's the end of their life cycle and then they want to die because they made their seeds. They made the seeds. They're done. So just grow vertically. And hydroponically actually grows a lot better, a lot faster and um, higher yields of cucumbers. Like I grew my cucumbers in soil and I got like six pieces. I grew cucumbers in a, in a hydroponic without, without an air stone. They're calling it crap key, crap key hydroponics without an air stone. Anyways, um, I grew it like that and I got like 20 cucumbers. So I'm just saying like, if she really wants to increase yield, I would say hydroponic and vertical. I and grow a lot of greens. So what should we do? Like I live in Colorado and there's all this amaranth growing. Ooh. Do you have any like philosophical thoughts around gathering? wild amaranth and then growing it like on my patio? Should I not do that? Should I continue to go forage it? Like, do you have any thoughts on this? I think that if you are, if you are able to forage and you want to develop a connection with the land that you're in that way, you can do that and that's fine. 
But if you also want to take some of the seeds and grow it for yourself so you don't have to keep on taking, um, then that's, I think that's better. As long as you're saving seeds and send and putting seed back out, you know, not just, oh, I'm going to grow some and that's it. And then I don't need you anymore. Uh, just save seeds and give it back to the, to the earth. Yeah. I, that's, that's what I think. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay, so we have like a couple of questions from um, Heather, who is the um, the Ibex puppetry um, a funder for the program uh, under Green Feather. So her first question is, what intention do I sing my songs to the plants? I always tell the flowers that they're really pretty, but for plants I am going to eat please, please, please don't die. Thank you for giving me your life so that I may live. So kind of like the intention, uh, what should you kind of be putting into the plants? So that's her first question. And then the second one is, I think my soil has too much nitrogen. I made, I made it with lots of blood meal on straw. Is there something I can add to the soil since the soil is not so acidic? Okay, if you put too much nitrogen in the soil, the only way to reduce nitrogen is either to flood your soil and let it drain out if it's in a pot and to amend it with more drop, with more brown matter. That's basically the only way to, to mitigate nitrogen burn. And you will tell if you have too much nitrogen in your soil because your plants will start acting like they're burning um, even though there's, even though sun or, or light isn't an issue. Um, so basically nothing you can do except Flood the soil, drain it, or um, amend and and um, amend it with dry matter like uh, paper, you know, more straw, mulch it up with more straw. Increase maybe something. No, because that's too much stress for it. I was gonna say increase the you know add you know phosphorus and stuff. You already put bone meal that has that in it. Um, Bone meal is not gonna, not gonna, it's not high in nitrogen. That's not what's gonna be the problem. Unless you put too much phosphorus or too much bone meal, then it has too much phosphorus and too much um, trace minerals, too much potassium and, uh, well, not potassium, mostly phosphorus. Could be phosphorus burn. I would still amend it, amend it with, with new soil. Mm -hmm. If you're putting too much nutrition of any kind in your soil, it's gonna burn it. And the only thing you can do is add better soil. Take out old soil, add new. Flood it with water. Hope the extras leach out. And the other thing is about the intention of when you're speaking to your plants while they're growing, as well as while you're har harvesting. I mean, you don't just, when you're harvesting, be like, please don't die. Like, you know, you know, give me, you know, please feed me, but don't die. You know, that's kind of, that's sad. It will make the plant sad. You don't talk to it like that. You, you. You, and you can tell that it's pretty and stuff, but you gotta be like, you know, you thank it and you see when you're checking it for health, say, how are you doing today? And you, you check it for how it's doing. Just like you would talk to a child if you're giving them a checkup or something, you know? But not, don't make you feel bad, okay? Don't be like, please, please, please don't die on me. <laughs> Well, that's a good note to end on. Uh, thank you so much, Phoenix. Are there any closing statements you want to make or otherwise we'll wrap the class and tell people about next week's panel? Okay, uh, trial and error is, um, that's the, the thing you're going to have to go through. Trial and error, keep it in mind. Don't water too much. Don't let it dry out. Don't overfeed it with nutrition. And um, Google and YouTube is a good friend to find out how to grow vertically and to Google those images of what could be wrong with my plant. Show me a disease chart. Show me a nutrition deficiency chart. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> That's well, all I got. Thank you so much. We appreciate you coming. Um, hopefully you'll be able to join us for our panel next week with Unchi Kristenia Yala. She is joining us again to lead the panel. Um, the way that First Foods is set up 
is that the last week of the month, we always have a panel featuring our speakers and instructors from earlier in the month. So we'll be having a discussion um, and hope that you'll join us. We have the same registration link all the way through July. Um, Phoenix is throwing her phone like across the room. <laughs> Sorry, it's just, I'm having a hard time with my camera. It looked like it was upside down and then, <laughs> no, I turned it. Oh, you're funny, it's okay. Um, so yeah, we hope that you'll come back. Again, thank you to our partner, mm -hmm. IVEX Puppetry and the community that continues to come to these classes and watch our premieres on Mondays at lunchtime, 1130. Mountain time is when that happens. They go up. So if you want to watch again or you missed it or you want to see Phoenix's slides again because she had so many good slides, those will be <laughs> available on Monday. So with that, thank you. And we will see you next week. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.